information, feel free to type questions in the chat box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. However, your questions will only be addressed after the last panelist has presented. If you're dialing in, you can email your questions to events at cwny.org. So again, your questions are important. Feel free to type them at any time in the chat box and they will be addressed at the end. Now, our esteemed panelists are Assistant District Attorney, Jessica Melton, Amanda Eckert of Restore New York City, Tori Corbello of uh, Lifeway Network, Kyra Wooden of Ekpat USA, and unfortunately, Karen uh, Siegel, Siegel of Zanta Club of Greater Queens could not be with us, but I will present on behalf of Zanta International and Zanta USA. ADA Jessica Melton has graced us with her presence. As you know, she's very busy. Uh, she is the chief of the newly created Human Trafficking Bureau of the Queens County District Attorney's Office. She has many years experience and I personally have uh, been to her other presentations as many years ago as, as 10, 15 years ago. So uh, she is a wealth of knowledge and we are very grateful for her. So uh, Jessica, please speak on human trafficking in Queens County. Hi, uh, yes, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Victoria. And on behalf of the District Attorney of Queens County, Melinda Katz, I just want to thank the Center of the Women of New York for including um, us in this conversation today. I really appreciate you organizing this um, and really allowing us to collaborate with all of these other agencies so we can create a greater network to combat trafficking. The district attorney just took office uh, in January of this year of 2020. A lot has gone on since January, including the COVID crisis. But um, one of the district attorney's main priorities um, is in her administration is doing everything that we can do to combat human trafficking and to really connect trafficking victims and survivors with services um, and options um, out of their, their trafficking situations. That's why last month she created the newly formed Human Trafficking Bureau. We are now the first office in the city to have an entire bureau that's fully dedicated to combat trafficking. And in doing that, we want to expand our scope um, not to just prosecuting traffic, traffickers, but it's also um, reaching out more into the community to make sure as law enforcement, we're doing all we can to really identify trafficking victims to the best um, we can. Um, can you go to the second slide, please? Now in our bureau, we prosecute all sex and labor trafficking. I'm not going to go into all the details of the different types of trafficking, because I know a lot of my other panelists um, go into certain specific areas in each in both sex and labor trafficking, but basically uh, human trafficking when you think of human trafficking as a definition, you think of um, somebody being transported moved from state to state from country to country. The new human trafficking laws that just took effect in 2000 do not require any proof of uh, transport or travel or movement in order for us to prove trafficking exists. Basically, Trafficking is using any force, fraud, or coercion uh, to compel someone to either engage in or to continue to engage in either sex or labor in exchange um, for money. It's really a subculture of modern day slavery. And the more I've been working on these cases, the more I realize how much is happening in our community and in Queens County, right under our noses um, where people are seeing them. So I think community awareness is also um, very important, which is why it's important that you're organizing this event to get the word out so we can all work together to make sure we're really doing everything we can to identify uh, trafficking in our communities. Um, moving on to the next slide, this was the latest legal um, really achievement we've achieved in, in combating trafficking from a prosecution level, from a law enforcement perspective. Less than two years ago, Governor Cuomo signed a law into effect in which established that we no longer have to prove any force to establish trafficking of an underage child. And this is extremely significant. We're one of the last states in the country 
to enact a law um, that says it is now sex trafficking if you advance or profit from the prostitution of anybody under 18 years old, whether force was used, wasn't used, whether there are any threats, because children really are below the age of legal consent. So when you're exploiting someone who's underage, that should in itself be considered trafficking, whether or not there's any force. So this was a huge tool. It's now a B violent felony in New York to advance a profit from the prostitution of anybody under um, 18 years old, and you'd be facing up to 25 years. This is a huge tool that the legislature and advocates um, like my panelists and others um, have helped to achieve um, in, in creating these laws. Can you move on to the next slide, please? Generally at the heart of trafficking is it, it's based on power and control. Um, the traffickers target the most vulnerable members of our community. And I know each of the panelists, um, I know we're gonna go into specific areas of the, of, um, the vulnerabilities um, and especially with um, domestic relationships and trauma bonding and the forms of control that um, traffickers use to really profit from other people. I want to talk a little bit about um, what I've noticed is an underreported area of trafficking in Queens County. You know, Queens County, we're the world's borough. We are the most diverse county in the, in the state, in the country, if not the world. Um, and we're very rich for that. But a consequence of all of this diversity is there's a lot of different forms of trafficking in different ethnic communities, especially with the current culture we're in with the fear of deportation. Traffickers are taking this fear and they're really using it. These are organized um, criminals who are in, in trafficking for profit base. They're looking to make money and they target the most vulnerable people and use those fears and vulnerabilities to exploit. Um, and specifically with respect to our immigrant communities, we've heard horror, horror stories of threats of deportation, threats of imprisonment, threats of arrest, um, if a victim of trafficking reports their trafficking. These threats are not true. Um, we, nobody in, who's reported human trafficking to the district attorney's office has ever been reported to immigration officials. In fact, we go out of our way to connect to anybody who is, has immigration issues with services to help them um, become legal. We've signed off on T visas and U visas, and I believe, and that's why it's important we're out here now, getting that word out into the communities that it's safe to report your trafficking is an important um, tool that we need to use to combat traffickers, uh, combat trafficking in our community. Um, and that's why, especially we're seeing it with our Asian massage parlors and even with our Latin American communities, a lot of trafficking is going unreported because of the fear of deportation. The district attorney hired an immigration specialist um, just last month and that immigration specialist has met with me and we're going to be using um, him to connect trafficking victims to better services um, and connect them to um, any tools they need to help escape the, the trade. So that is where our main focus is right now. And really it's a multi, it's really combating trafficking. We, all of our organizations do it with different priorities. We're all on the same page. Everyone here wants to end trafficking, but we're all doing it from different areas. And I believe that community awareness is very important to get the word out. Um, to provide outreach and services, preventative outreach as well, preventative outreach to at-risk youth and community members who are, you know, who could easily be victimized by a trafficker, as well as outreach into the community to people who may be um, being trafficked um, in our society to let them know that it's safe to report this. And in the district attorney's office, one of our main tools that we're using to combat trafficking is we want to get the traffickers. We want to prosecute the traffickers. Rarely does any of these traffickers have more than what have one victim. They all have more than one victim. And we're not going to combat it unless we stop the people that are doing it. And that's why we are um, really, we're going to use this multi-pronged approach 
to be reaching out into the community more to get the word out it's safe to report so we can we can prosecute these traffickers and i know victoria we spoke a little bit about um collateral consequences in our our activism as well um in what we choose to do for example we're making leaps and bounds but as we see during the COVID crisis these traffickers, um, a lot of these businesses are shut down, but the trafficking is still going on. It's just going on in different forms behind closed doors. So we need to step up our responses and keep learning to get ahead of the traffickers. I know many of, most of you know, um, it was a huge success. Backpage.com was shut down several years ago um, because Backpage should be shut down. People shouldn't be profiting from advertisements of trafficking victims, underage children. One consequence of Backpage being shut down is Backpage was coming into court and testifying on our prosecutions. They were taking down advertisements. Now we notice the traffickers have shifted to different websites, some that are overseas. So we are improving our response on a, on a computer level too to try to combat trafficking in different ways. So I think that's something which we all need to coordinate on to make sure we're working together um, to get around um, where these traffickers are taking us. And now we're seeing even an uptake in internet trafficking now since the store fronts are closed. It's a profit-based business and these are organized traffickers and we need to really work together to go after them. Can you go over to the next slide? That This is my contact information. That's my phone number. It goes right to my cell phone day or night, um, please take it. If you even suspect trafficking is occurring in your community, if you know someone that may need to, may want to report it. And the importance is we don't, you know, if you ask anybody, do you want to report a crime? They're going to tell you no. They're going to say, why would I want to go talk to the police, especially about something that's traumatic. Um, but we really invite in the DA's office victims to come in and just discuss their options in reporting. Just because you come talk to us doesn't mean that we're gonna go forward um, without your consent. We understand the control and the trauma that's involved. Um, and we really wanna create the most welcoming environment. Um, and even if any service care provider or community member wants to just ask hypothetical questions about what the process is in reporting, we welcome all any, any information from the community because we really can't do this sitting on our offices. We need help from the outside. We need help from service care providers and the community to make sure we combat trafficking. So my phone number's up there. It's 718-286-6657. Please feel free to call anytime. Thank you, Jessica. Our next presenter is Amanda Eckerd, Executive Director of Restore. Restore uh, New York City is, exists to end sex trafficking in New York and restore the well being and independence of foreign national survivors. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we're so grateful to be here as a representative of one of many anti-trafficking organizations here in New York City. Uh, you'll see our tagline there is making freedom real. We focus on aftercare here in New York. And today I'll be talking about one critical aspect of aftercare in this particular season, which is economic empowerment for people who've been trafficked. Our mission is to end sex trafficking in New York and to restore the well being and independence of foreign national survivors. And I must say that this work cannot be done alone. It absolutely needs to be uh, taking place in collaboration with our partners. So I'm thrilled to be here today with Jessica, our ADA, um, and in partnership with Melinda Katz, our Queens County DA. Also, on behalf of ECPAT, we've worked closely with Lori Cohen um, and as she was at Sanctuary for Families previously and with Marianne Kendall at Lifeway. So yeah, it's an honor to be partnering with each of these organizations today as we share about the incredible challenges of trafficking in our city here in New York. Okay, so, you know, I imagine as we're talking about trafficking, we cannot have this conversation without addressing the pandemic that we are facing and also the realities of the institutional, the systemic racism that's intersecting right now with 
our dialogue that's taking place within our community at a national level, at a local level, within our organizations. Uh, here in New York City, we know this pandemic to be the epicenter, not only in New York, but across the world. And in New York City, one out of every five deaths has taken place uh, for our nation. And at Restore, we oftentimes talk about human trafficking as a public health issue. We talk about a pandemic as a public health issue. We talk about institutional racism as a pu public health issue. And so these, these topics are especially relevant in this, this very moment. Our team has also been talking about phases of disaster. And uh, this model comes from SAMHSA, which is based in Baltimore, Maryland. It's our government arm addressing mental health and substance use. And they have helped to create a way of understanding of how society responds to disasters and post-disaster work. And at Restore, this has been especially relevant for us. Um, you'll notice here on the y-axis, there is this you know, line of emotional highs and lows. How much energy are we exerting in the face of a trauma, in the face of a disaster? Uh, for us, this is the pandemic here in New York City. And then on the x-axis on the bottom is time. And here in New York City, you know, we began facing warnings and threats back in January, February. Our point of impact with COVID was in mid-March. And what typically happens within societies is there is this period of heroicism, this honeymoon phase that transpires after a disaster, uh, this period of strong community cohesion, which is then followed by a period of disillusionment which lasts up until about the year mark. So for us in New York City, we anticipate this will be likely through December, at which point an anniversary uh, takes place, and then a period of reconstruction. And this particular model has informed our three phase approach of work, which you'll see in our next slide here. So at Restore, we have three phases that we've stepped into in this season. Um, if we can go on to the next slide, you'll see we have our relief phase, recovery phase, and a rebuilding phase. And we have just exited at Restore our relief phase of work. So at Restore, relief focuses on safety and recovery for survivors of trafficking, uh, our area of specialty in the aftercare space across 12 weeks. And right now we're in 13 weeks post the pandemic hit in mid-March. So we are beginning right now our recovery phase of work for the next seven months. Um, what does recovery look like for us at Restore? What does this mean for survivors in our community in New York City? Well, firstly, it's important to acknowledge that housing continues to be and will be an ongoing growing crisis for uh, people who are trafficked in our community and for survivors who've been trafficked. Uh, Columbia University just published research that suggests there will be a 45% increase in homelessness through December. 2020, we know that the individuals we serve with great vulnerabilities are going to be impacted when it comes to housing. Job loss has been considerable for people historically who have been in poverty. It's especially impacting uh, the Black community and also Latino community here in New York City with unemployment rates as high as 70 percent. For the women we serve at Restore, survivors of trafficking, 80% uh, of employed survivors have lost their jobs post COVID. And this is just devastating. So our recovery work is focusing, is attending to that. And then rebuilding phase, which will begin in January is a period of recreation for many nonprofits, for many organizations. We're wondering what does this next phase look like? Do our organizations continue to operate as is? Um, we've thought a lot at Restore about cross-sector collaboration. We've thought a lot about technology integration. We've thought a lot um, and are doing work around like true survivor empowerment um, and also community creation. And so lastly, I'll end with uh, Restore's approach to economic empowerment. Um, first, I wanna make known that 
you know, survivors of trafficking have years of lost wages as they are being trafficked. And so in many respects at Restore, we talk about creating a replacement economy. So there needs to be on the side of aftercare as victims of trafficking exit their situation, um, there needs to be a set of solutions that serve as an opportunity for advancement in the marketplace and advancement in business for opportunities for, for not just minimum wage, but living wage and promotion on the job. And at Restore, we are in our fifth year of economic empowerment solutions at Restore. Uh, we launched a worker-owned cooperative back in 2016 that is survivor-owned, survivor, -owned, survivor um, led business of 80 women who've been trafficked. We partner with 30 businesses in the community. That program is partially funded by Department of Justice. And we are training organizations across the nation in how to invest in economic empowerment and economic justice for survivors of trafficking. In this season with so many women that we serve having lost jobs, we're focused on targeted reemployment. So let me talk for a moment about what that looks like. Um, at Restore, we have invested in business partnerships. Here in the city, as I said, we have 30 business partners. Only about half we anticipate will be able to come back up after we return uh, you know, in phase two and phase three. So we are focused on partnering with increasing number of social minded businesses for those who are joining in on this webinar and asking like, how can I get involved? How can I engage? This is one way. If you are a business owner, you know of people who may be hiring and have a heart for supporting survivors of trafficking in reemployment efforts. Um, this is a way that you can be connecting with Restore and a number of our partners here on the call. The second strategy for us is entrepreneurship and investment in survivor-led businesses. So at Restore, we wanna be about job creation and having survivors create jobs, not just re-employment with business partners. So at Restore, we partnered last year with NYU for a certificate course, and we are having a pitch night in the next month for a number of survivors who've gone through our entrepreneurship track who are ready and prepared with a mentor to launch their own enterprises. And this, we believe, is a critical investment during this period, during a time of recession, as we just learned yesterday, is official for us. Um, what better moment uh, to engage in creative business investment um, and for survivors of trafficking who have had um, so much of their work history um, taken from them for, for years while being trafficked. So we wanna pour back in, we wanna invest in this space and we can only do this, I'll, I'll close and say, we can only do this in collaboration with partners. Our partners here on the call, um, our community here in New York City and even across the US. Uh, and we're grateful for each of you considering uh, investing in supporting our anti-trafficking initiatives here in the city. Thank you, Amanda. Our next presenter, Tori Corbello, is from Lifeway Network. And Lifeway Network confronts the reality of human trafficking every day by changing the future for women survivors through their safe housing program. So we welcome Tori. Thank you, and definitely want to echo our thanks to CWNY for having us be part of this conversation. We fully believe that education about human trafficking is just as important through a pandemic or whatever might occur in the future as it is any other day. So appreciate that. And uh, to echo Amelia's point, it would be a mistake not to mention how racial injustice has played a major role in labor trafficking. So since slavery was abolished in 1865 in the United States, we have seen it just kind of evolve in different ways. So take for instance, in Alabama, very shortly after 1865, um, black men specifically were targeted because corporations were in a major panic, including the mining industry that needed cheap labor. And so would arrest 
for very minor crimes such as cursing in public, trespassing, and once brought to uh, face justice, of course, they never received that justice. They would be issued a fine in which they were not able to pay, in which case a, a businessman would come forward, offer to pay that fine at a price. And that price was to come work at a mine, for instance, uh, sometimes indefinitely under very harsh working conditions. Now, we might think, well, that was a long time ago. But unfortunately, we see a very similar practice happening in countries like the Congo, where very similar, very similar circumstances, people are arrested for very minor crimes and held to work in, uh, in situations that they cannot get out of because of debt bondage. And even though it might be taking place in other countries, oftentimes Western businesses are benefiting from that practices and the minerals uh, that are excavated and benefit consumers here in the Western countries. So it's just to say we have a long way to go. Uh, we definitely have our work cut out for us, but there's certainly a path forward. So uh, I started off with this slide because agriculture is one of the industries that I would like to chat about today in regards to the COVID crisis. We can thank you. Uh, so just on a global scale to understand labor trafficking to start off this conversation. Uh, labor trafficking is probably one of the more common forms of trafficking that we see across the globe. In fact, uh, there's about 16 million individuals who are trafficked through the private sector. And that represents about 40% of human trafficking cases globally and about 10% are state imposed trafficking. So that's labor trafficking that's conducted by a state or militia group. Now it's quite a big number and we have to think why is this happening? What is leading to such exploitation by people? So there's a couple of reasons for this, some of which are outlined on the screen. The first is that labor trafficking, we like to call it a high profit, low risk industry, meaning that there's very little risk involved for those who are exploiting. There's many loopholes in the law. Very rarely are they prosecuted for their crimes. But the, at the same time, there's a benefit for them financially. So without these consequences, there's nothing to deter them from doing otherwise. The second is supply and demand. There's a high demand for cheap goods as well as cheap labors. So traffickers exploit this demand and want to meet this demand by supplying individuals to meet consumers' needs for cheap goods and cheap labors. And then the third is systematic inequalities as well as vulnerabilities. Traffickers are very aware of um, vulnerable factors in individuals. Of course, anyone hypothetically could be trafficked but certain groups are more vulnerable and traffickers try to meet the needs of individuals in order to meet their own needs. And one more thing that I would outline that's not on this screen is uh, the misconceptions around human trafficking as well as uh, the difficulty to identify cases of human trafficking also make this crime particularly difficult. Industries as well as um, places where labor trafficking is common. So we might ask ourselves, where does it occur? And as you see from the screen, it's not just occurring in the darkest corners of the globe in dark alleyways. As you see from these pictures, these are very common settings that we frequent on a daily basis or settings that produce commodities that we buy on a daily basis. So there's a couple of more common ones in the United States, uh, those being domestic servitude, traveling sales crews, as well as agriculture. Uh, uh, traveling sales crews is a little different than domestic servitude and agriculture in that uh, those that we see that tend to be trafficked are um, youth who are domestic born, whereas for domestic servitude and agriculture, uh, they tend to be foreign born. So I'll focus in terms of the COVID crisis on domestic servitude in agriculture. 
Uh, so remember, a lot of individuals who are trafficked, and we see this at Lifeway, are undocumented. So they, during this COVID crisis, many of them don't necessarily qualify for unemployment. However, uh, there was relief for those in the gig economy, but uh, what we see is that those in domestic servitude don't necessarily have uh, contracts that are written out or documentation of their hours. So it's very difficult for them to get any kind of relief in that manner. And certainly there are those who are documented. However, there was misconceptions going around that and concerns over public charge, meaning uh, individuals were concerned about applying for unemployment uh, because they were fearful that it might help or uh, hinder their chances later on of receiving a green card or citizenship. So one of the coalitions that we were working on uh, thought to produce a campaign around uh, knowing your rights to help that a little bit more. Uh, with agriculture, there are many who have an H-2A visa. Um, and during this COVID time, there was proposals from the Trump administration to lower the wages of those in agriculture, which is concerning as it's a very difficult industry to work in, as well as, as, well as a very low paying. And uh, a very common way that individuals are trafficked into agriculture is that uh, they pay individuals to secure these visas. And even though it's illegal for someone to exploit someone by helping them to get this visa and taking in money in this way, it's very rarely looked after or, uh, or um, enforced. So as a result, many people unfortunately uh, are in debt bondage. So that would further put them in a dangerous situation. And also in agriculture, uh, we're, we were seeing just how difficult really it is for social distancing as they tend to live in crowded housing and uh, take very crowded transportation. So the same standards that we hold each other to might not be the standards that are available for everyone. And then one more industry that I would like to highlight in regard to the COVID um, uh, pandemic is uh, the garment industry. So the garment industry for a while now has been under heat for uh, the lack of transparency. They have very complicated supply chains as well as multiple hundreds of factories that can work across its supply chain and then subcontracting. Um, so there's a lack of accountability and it's very easy for trafficking to occur because of the complex nature of the supply chains. But during this COVID crisis, unfortunately, uh, many companies had to cancel their orders, but many of these orders were already in place. And uh, even till this day, there are companies that are refusing to pay for orders that are already in progress or have been completed. And some of those companies we're very aware of um, might be familiar to you, such as Urban Outfitters, JCPenney's, Walmart. So you can go to supportgarmentworkers.org and follow their tracker. Many companies have agreed because of public pressure, but this is um, an ongoing conversation with these groups um, to make sure that people are paid for the work that they ended up doing, whether or not the orders were canceled. These are just some common ways that individuals are recruited for labor trafficking. Um, and the first job offer an advertisement, very common, even for all of us that might be looking for a job. So that's no surprise. False promises and fraud, as I mentioned before, traffickers like to exploit vulnerabilities in individuals. So they'll promise them and try to uh, convince and persuade that person that they're able to fill whatever gap that that person might have in their life, whether it's a need for a job because they're fleeing a very dangerous situation. Uh, traffickers are very persuasive. Uh, smuggling related, even though smuggling is not uh, necessarily a case of trafficking, uh, there are instances where that does go wrong. Of course, consent can change at any point, so we have to remember that. Uh, threats can be used right off the bat. It can also happen later on, not just in the recruitment phase, but certainly that can happen very, very early on. And 
Unfortunately, uh, people are trafficked by people that they know, including in their family, which is particularly devastating. Here's just some red flags to keep in mind. I know that still, uh, especially in New York, we're still coming out of COVID. So uh, seeing people in person is not as common, but certainly we see people like um, delivery individuals and we'll start to uh, be going out a lot more. So these are important red flags to keep in mind and just some bigger categories. I know some of the questions that I get are, what does a building look like that has labor trafficking? And you might not necessarily see such evident signs. What's important to note is the dynamics of a situation. Does it make you feel uncomfortable? Does it seem that there's a lack of control in uh, amongst uh, workers? So do they seem that they're like they're frequently monitored? Does it seem that they uh, don't have control over their own money? Is there high surveillance? These types of factors may make you feel very uncomfortable. Um, also, just the work conditions of a place. I highlighted before the lack of safety equipment. Sometimes that's not afforded to everyone, um, especially working long hours. So, for instance, you might go into a store in the morning and see a child there. Okay, no big deal. But then maybe you go a few hours later during school hours, maybe, or even later on at night, and that kid is still there. That may be an indication to you that uh, something is not right. Um, certainly someone who's paid very little or only paid through tips or speaks to living in a very overcrowded condition or that they have a huge debt to pay to an employer. These are just some of the factors, but this is not a comprehensive list by any means. Okay, so this is Lifeway. So we are one of two trafficking safe houses in New York City. We service uh, women survivors, particularly both foreign born and domestic born um, who have suffered from organ trafficking, labor trafficking, as well as sex trafficking. And at Lifeway, we recognize that they come from a place of fear and exploitation. And we try to meet them where they're at by offering them safe housing where they live amongst a community of women religious as well as volunteers and receive services there. And we consider it their home. Our education program and advocacy focuses on bringing the learnings from the safe house to the wider public and making sure that we're partnering with many of the groups that you see here um, in this panel, but also in the wider community to make sure um, that we're spreading awareness and combating some of these misconceptions and continue to support people identify cases of human trafficking. Our WINGS mentorship program is for our women who have uh, completed their stay with the safe house. Um, they, we recognize that, you know, just because they left the safe housing doesn't mean that they are completely healed. Of course, it's such a complex traumatic experience to be trafficked. Uh, one definitely need support way after. So uh, they meet over a series of a few weeks over a curriculum and work on life skills and really just have the support of each other. That social network is so important for them. And the partnerships that we have, whether it's referring agencies or coalitions that we sit on uh, are very critical to this work as well. So you know, all these components together, we hope to bring the women to a place of safety. And during this COVID crisis, many of the women expressed how thankful they were to be in a safe house during this time. Of course, it's, as I mentioned before, it's their home. So they didn't have to fear eviction at that point. Um, they have their basic supplies. So in that regard, um, it's an okay place to be for the meantime. Um, and it, we, if we have different survivors, um, but many of them, as I mentioned before, are, un, are unfortunately undocumented. Some of some were working, so it hit everyone a little bit differently. Uh, but Lifeway did start a COVID fund uh, to support them during this time uh, to relieve the stress just a little bit more. And the COVID fund was unrestricted because we trust these women. We don't need to babysit what they do with their money. They're adults. Um, 
and it and they use it in many different ways. So we left that to their discretion. We're happy to be able to uh, offer them just a little bit of something during this time. But um, and I think the other thing that we noticed in terms of education and advocacy, of course, um, legislation slowed down quite a bit. Um, and of course, groups were tackling such as schools, congregations, uh, communities that we would usually educate. Uh, of course, we're dealing with COVID in their own ways, so that has slowed down a little bit. Um, but we just continue to build the foundation so that when individuals are ready, uh, we can go back out there. I would just like to end with two ways that we can continue to take action after this conversation. So the first is the human trafficking hotline. I recommend that if you don't have that in your phone to write it down right now. It's on the top. Uh, essentially, they are just a helpful resource. If you do come across a situation that you do feel uncomfortable and you wanna chat with someone, you don't have to make a report, um, but you can also make a report with them as well. And um, uh, some of the concerns specifically around, for instance, uh, those in domestic servitude was that many groups would continue to be further exploited during this crisis. Um, so a lot of the warnings that were put out there was, hey, if you do have individuals that are coming to uh, support with your kids or come clean your house, don't further exploit them. Don't, if you have them come live so that they're not trans transporting from one place to another in your house, um, don't have them work more hours, uh, you know, give them the pay that they deserve. So you might know many people who do have um, that kind of support around their house. So, it, so you might be hearing conversations, you might not necessarily see it. So having this resource at your disposal is, uh, is really, really critical during this time. And the last uh, take action that I would emphasize is conscious consumerism. And that can look so differently person to person. I'll recommend one thing that's helped me is looking for fair trade labels for commodities. Um, fair trade has just grown so much since I even started my fair trade journey. And essentially, as you can see on the photo, there's different types of uh, fair trade labels. They all kind of represent the same thing more or less. So you don't have to worry about which one is better um, in terms of the benefits that they have to artisans and consumers, uh, artisans and farmers. It's uh, all very beneficial, um, but you'll see it placed on commodities in that in in the front or in the back, and that just communicates to you not only that uh, the products were made through rigorous environmental standards and that the communities are being invested to, but also the human component that they were paid a fair wage, that there's audits for child labor and child trafficking, uh, stringent policies. And there's a third party who is looking into this. So it's a great uh, model to look at if you're interested in developing your conscious consumerism. And I'll leave you with my email address. Please feel free to email me at any time. We do offer continued education to uh, community groups and concerned individuals. And as I mentioned before, we have a lot of work to do so we'd be happy to partner with you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tori. So next we have Kyra Wooden, who is the Youth Outreach Manager at ECPAT USA. Hi, everyone. Um, Thank you, Victoria, for introducing me. I really want to thank all of you guys, the audience and the panelists for being here. Um, this is completely voluntary. And so it's really awesome that you guys are spending your time learning more about a public health issue that we need to talk about. Um, so I run the Youth Against Child Trafficking Program, or it's called the WIAC program. And so I'll go through what our program is and our current Read It, Set It campaign. Um, and I'll talk to you more about the sex trafficking issue in the United States. Um, okay, so at ECPAT USA, our mission is to protect every child's basic human right to grow up free from the threat of sexual exploitation and trafficking. Um, and so 
I think that this is really important because I've witnessed firsthand what happens to kids when they go through something traumatic, whether it's boys living on the streets, being forced to beg for money only to bring that money back to their exploiter, or a young girl is caught in a sex trafficking ring um, who only got there after escaping her abusive parents in the first place. Um, it causes lots of young people pain while kids are extremely resilient and able to recover they're more likely than other people and other survivors to be exploited again and again. So if there's any small thing that we can do to protect, prevent this from happening, we have the responsibility to do so. And one way that we can do this is shed light on this problem to our key stakeholders and who this is affecting, our victims and our young people. Um, and talking about it with them really matters. And this affects, as we have said today, more than just our kids. Okay, so what does ECPAT USA do about it? So first we do youth education, which is the sector that I'm a part of. So we empower youth to take the lead against trafficking by equipping them with the knowledge and tools necessary to become activists on the subjects. Um, kids at local high schools in New York City wanted more information about human trafficking um, and they formed groups to share this um, information with their friends and to spread awareness. And for many victims of abuse, the first step to breaking the cycle is often realizing that the relationship um, isn't worth saving and isn't healthy to begin with. And so the beginning of that realization can be as simple as receiving information for the very first time about what healthy relationships and unhealthy relationships look like. And that's a core focus on our youth program. Um, and it's really about helping participants understand the differences between healthy and unhealthy relationships. Um, and this is a process that can help young people start to self-identify as victims, which is very hard to notice if you are trauma bonding with the very person who is also offering you that care and attention. We also do private sector engagement. So we promote more corporate responsibility among private companies um, with a strong focus in the tourism sectors. And so executives at major hotel chains like Marriott and Hyatt are taking ownership over the fact that human trafficking um, and sexual exploitation exists in their hotels and motels. Um, and you can't simply ignore it. You have to think about not only um, who, are, who are the people who are the residents and, and using your venues, but also who are the people supplying your supply chains. Um, also, Uber is now set, stepping up to understand that ride sharing can also be used to, expo um, to exploit young people and it's used by traffickers um, who uses this demand economy and other forms of transportation. They use Uber to move between towns and cities to abuse their victims and, and Uber is now um, training their individuals to recognize the signs of trafficking too. We also do community education. Oh, sorry. Uh, we also do community education. So ECPAT leads programs, we lead events, initiatives to inform our communities about this human rights issue. Um, we conduct research and also publish reports and raise awareness um, about the forms of child sexual exploitation and how it takes place. Um, and we use these reports as the basis for our advocacy pan campaigns. And finally, we also do legislation um, advocacy. We advocate for federal and state legislation that prevents exploitation, protects children, and guarantees that any child who is subjected to sexual slavery and sex trafficking will not be prosecuted in the courts uh, for prostitution. Okay, um, so human trafficking. So looking at sex trafficking, there are a couple of components. So there is the commercial sexual act. So this is when something of value is exchanged for sexual services. This could be money, food, clothing, or even shelter. Um, one of the key differences between human trafficking and sex work, um, yes, it also involves coercion, but, uh, but mostly it's that victims cannot stop or abandon the sex work by their own free will. Um, we, this also includes prostitution and CSAM, which is child sexual abuse material or child pornography, as you might've been heard before. We try not to use the word pornography anymore because it connotes some sort of entertainment or choice, which young people don't have um, in this matter. Um, CSAM is any representation of any means of a child who is subjected to real or simulated explicit um, 
sexual activities or any representation of sexual parts of a child for se sexual purposes. Um, this includes photographs, recordings, um, and are made during real criminal acts of sexual abuse of children um, that focus on the genitalia and they can be sold online. And this problem, specifically this problem in the climate we are in with the coronavirus where lots of people, both our victims, our traffickers and our exploiters have more time and access to the internet, we believe that there is going to be a huge increase in online sexual exploitation. Um, it is illegal to even own one single CSAM image. Um, trafficking also covers non-commercial sexual abuse as well and any combinations of what I just mentioned. So human trafficking also includes labor trafficking, um, a lot of which Tori was mentioning. Um, as she was saying, it is common in the United States. People are forced to work in homes as domestic servants. Um, there's this idea of debt bondage where a person or family takes small loans to um, survive and it multiplies um, by the debtor. Um, this, and they live in constant fear of this. They're be beyond being forced to work labor trafficked youth are also often sexually ex um, exploited to and experience sexual harassment, and sexual assault. Um, traffickers also can withhold different items, key items such as identification, money, um, some of the common industries Tori has mentioned and also are listed here, farmers, um, restaurants, cleaning services, constructions, factories, and more. The um, private companies in the hospitality and tourism industry that we work with, we promote them to know um, and take responsibility for knowing where their supply chains come from. Okay, so now who are our victims? So this has been talked about a little bit. Um, and again, human trafficking um, is happening everywhere. It's happening in our cities and suburbs all across the world. There is no one face of human trafficking um, and victims can come from all backgrounds and that includes men, women, and children. Um, but there are, as we have been saying, there are some vulnerabilities that come to mind when we talk about trafficking. Uh, traffickers often target people living in poverty, they may be runaway or homeless youth, or kids in the foster care. One in seven endangered runaway victims, um, are one in sev seven are endangered of becoming sex trafficking victims. We also have to think about our LGBT LGBTQ youth population, often they face um, discrimination and social marginalization. They can feel isolated and rejected by their peers and their families. So when a trafficker seeks to offer them some of these, um, to fill some of these voids that they have been filling, uh, that they have been feeling, LGBTQ youth could be more susceptible to this. Um, and many people who have been trafficked have already have had some sort of domestic violence, assault, social discrimination, maybe even war or conflict in their countries that lead them into the situations. Um, foreigners who have paid significant recruitment and travel fees often become highly indebted to traffickers or their intermediaries. And so traffickers control and manipulate these individuals into knowing that they can't get work visas and, um, that the victim's sort of lack of familiarity with their surroundings, the laws, the language, their rights, um, and cultural understanding makes it really hard for them to live without their trafficker. So who are our perpetrators? So I think it's really important to know that exploiters and traffickers come from all different backgrounds. They could be male, they can be female, they can also come from various age groups. Um, a child is a victim of sex trafficking, even if they don't have a trafficker. For example, a lot of times in foster homes, young people say, hey, this is how I make money, this is how, what I do to survive, and they recruit other young victims of their age to help them. Um, traffickers, again, they it could be male or female. They can also, oftentimes the trafficker does mimic the background of their victim because they know sort of, again, their language, their culture, they know their vulnerabilities and they can empathize with someone from the same demographics as them. Um, so some of our perpetrators can be pimps, sex buyers, brothel owners or managers, massage parlor operators. Again, they can also be family members, acquaintances, classmates, employers, employment agencies, and again, other victims. So I was groomed. So this, um, a survivor, she said when she was 16, she met an older man at a local mall. Um, he started taking her on dates and buying her clothes and meals. Not long after they started dating, he coerced her into sex trafficking, convincing her that if 
if she complied, um, she would have never relied on anyone again. Um, she was forced to make money and eventually the trafficker put them in a role of recruiting other teenagers. And all that money went to the traffickers and she was completely under the traffickers control. And this process of grooming um, happens all the time, usually in conjunction with other methods. Um, and it's a method to teach an individual to accept an abusive relationship. Um, and it's a process long been used by traffickers. It's this continued cycle of abuse. It's slow and methodical and intentionally manipulating a person to the point where they can be victimized. Um, after establishing a sort of foundation of trust and care, abusers and traffickers will then start to make requests and test the victim's boundaries and sexual boundaries and see what can be be pushed. Um, it could start as a benign request to wear certain clothes or to change or respond to certain names, but it can slowly escalate to where the individual may no longer be able to leave the room without that person's permission. So, and throughout this process, um, this is normalized because the victim is also, is often isolated, which leads him or her to believe that there are no other options. And to accelerate this, traffickers will again confiscate, confiscate identification, money, they make the victim codependent and reliant on the trafficker. Um, and the abuser is more able to keep the individual from support networks. Um, and, the, and it's easier for the abuser to remain in control. So that's pretty grim, but thinking about what we can do about it. And then again, it starts with talking with the youths. And so that's why we created this program um, to prevent trafficking before the harm can occur to our young people. Um, and so we do facilitated workshops and guided conversations with middle school and high school age youth in New York City um, to learn about what sexual exploitation is and to instill protective behaviors in themselves and in their peers around them. WIAC takes the approach to not just lecture about these topics, but hear what young people know and also invite them to be the leaders and to share this message to the people around them because it's more impactful coming from young people than it is coming from any one of us. Um, and so we util utilize an interactive skills-based curricula um, that's holistic and includes um, a trauma-informed pedagogy to our workshops. So we have a three series um, designed for workshops that are all free of charge for schools. They include child sex trafficking, healthy relationships, which is our most popular one, and healthy virtual identities. So child sex trafficking. Um, so this is where students learn about these misconceptions, who's vulnerable, the warning signs and the red flags that they might see in their schools. And young people learn concrete ways that they can raise awareness about this issue, both in their schools or online. So this could be using campaigns, including this in their newspapers, starting student clubs, hosting a film screening or a talk or panel discussions, all different ways that young people can take action because oftentimes young people feel that they can't do anything about a lot of different things. They can't make these choices. So it feels really empowering when they could say, oh, I know about this issue. I know this affects my peers and I really wanna help. Um, so our most popular um, workshop is also healthy relationships. So this could, um, explores the components of a healthy and unhealthy relationship. We talk about what power and control looks like um, all the way from our most healthy relationships to our toxic or maybe unhealthy relationships to maybe abusive relationships. And we talk about these things on a spectrum and what may be red flags for other things. We talk about what consent actually looks like. And this session um, closes with a reflection piece for young people. And we talk about the ways that they can create boundaries in their existing relationships to make their relationships healthier. And also when it might be time and what resources are available for them if they do want to leave any current unhealthy or toxic uh, relationship. Finally, we have our Healthy Virtual Identities Workshop, which is rapidly becoming a more popular workshop considering COVID. Um, and again, it's sort of like with this growth of technology, we used to, sex trafficking was already hard to see on our streets, but now it's even more hard to see because it's moving to online venues. And traffickers are using social media platforms with these specific tactics um, that we have been talking about, for example, fake promises or false rewards, or just, or bonding or catfishing. Um, 
um, to lure in and recruit new victims into trafficking. Um, and so we address the sort of do's and don'ts of what they post on their profiles that would make them um, make a trafficker more likely to target them. We talk about what catfishing is, um, what, the uh, what the warning signs of an online predator are, and what the warning signs that someone might be trying to affect your online identity. Um, and then we talk about ways that they can make their online identities healthier while also still having fun online. And some of our program highlights, I think some of the most important things to take away from this is that when we first started this program in 2015, that first year, two students self-identified as victims at of sexual exploitation. And in my experience conducting these workshops, I've had several students who have come up to me and expressed that they were in unhealthy relationships and didn't necessarily know what to do. Um, you know, I think having, talking to young people directly about these things, all these students are able to leave comments at the end of the workshops. And so many young people said, we know about this and now we know the, the nitty gritty of it and what's going on um, so that we know what to do and what it actually looks like. Because a lot of young people think that trafficking is kidnapping or transporting over the border. And so now we have to educate young people to know that it's, it's happening in their own communities. Um, after our 2018 academic year, so last school year, we had a 26 overall increase in knowledge about trafficking. Um, over half of our students wanted to raise more awareness about child trafficking, and we have been supporting them in their schools to find ways that they can do that. 84% um, of students were able to give a definition of what consent was, and we were able to identify scenarios of consent. And 90% of the students, which I think is the most important statistic, were able to recognize luring trafficking uh, learn, learning tactics after our workshops. So the data sort of shows that student attract, there are, are students who are attracted to subjects and that this education is critically important in our school systems because they may not be receiving it elsewhere. Um, so I want to end off with some shameless promotion for the Y Act program. So we have our Youth Against Trafficking Instagram, which I think is really awesome. So if anybody in our audience has kids, I would encourage them to follow it. It's called Youth Against Trafficking. Um, and so we post things directly that speak to youth and to speak to our youth stakeholders. So we have campaigns, specifically our campaign right now, which I'll get into, um, to eliminate or to alleviate the effects of online sexual exploitation when we cannot physically be in schools to talk to them. So now we have a lot of things to check check and see if you have any sort of new unexplained friend requests, how predators are hard to see, and how are your photos being used. So to really have young people think critically about the content that they're putting online. So this is just an extra resource for young people who um, really want to stay engaged and to keep them safe while we don't have direct contact with them. Um, and in addition, so since Y Act is not necessarily in schools right now, we also did the Reddit Set It campaign. So we have posted on our website, ecpatusa.org slash, slash online safety tips. We have posted new guides for te uh, teachers, educators, parents, and young people for how they can stay safe while online. Um, and you guys could read these, li uh, these guides on our website. And then we're having lots of people who are posted on our Instagram page who um, have posted a sign with Reddit said it, meaning they read our, um, they read our guides about online safety and, sorry, I'm on an island, guys. They read our line about online safety and they were able to change their privacy settings on their accounts. Okay. Um, and finally, I just wanted to end with some signs of online sexual exploitation for our young people, just so we can keep a, a lookout. Um, young people may frequently, uh, this is for trafficking and for sexual exploitation. Um, they may frequently exit and enter the home despite the prohibition on travels. Um, they may work excessively long hours virtually or at home. Um, there's this new app called OnlyFans where young people and anybody can post sexual content and any content they want. So you wanna watch out for apps like that. They may display signs of depression or fear or sudden loss of con. Um, confidence. They could exhibit injuries and other signs of abuse, often um, fearing authority figures or having sort of coached speech with authorities figures is a sign that someone might be um, in control over them. They could receive sums of huge sums of money um, transferred into their Venmo, Cash App, and PayPal accounts. Again, a lot of this stuff is going virtual and we want to keep that in mind. 
Um, they could experience unusual sleep patterns because they can't really sleep at night or maybe they're sleeping all day because they're working at night. Um, they could spend lots of more time on the phone or checking with an unidentified or even older friend. They could subtly change their appearance or style. Um, they could have increase in deliveries, money or clothing or jewelry, and they may have inconsistent uh, explanations for any of the above. And I just want to mention when you're thinking or looking online for any signs of trafficking or exploitation, you want to think about the totality of signs that you're seeing and not simply one sign, because that could stigmatize someone who, um, you know, maybe someone who might be from, who might be undocumented and might not be familiar with the language and so they don't speak. Um, to authorities properly. Um, so there are things that um, we want to keep in mind that we don't want to stigmatize any individual. So think about all the signs if you think this is a case of trafficking before you report it. Thank you. Thank you, Kyra. So uh, before we move on to Zanta, I'd like to share an anecdote uh, from Carol Smolensky, one of the founders of ECPAT. And this was uh, about 10, 15 years ago. I was lucky enough to be in, in an ECPAT uh, presentation and she spoke about the code. She was hard pressed to have hotel managers and hotel corporations sign on to the code. And what is the code? The Tourism Child Protection Code of Conduct. And as we learned from all of our presenters, trafficking is all about transportation. It's all and quite a bit about the travel industry. So what ECPAT was promoting that hotels sign on and educate their workers. And so we can help these children, these helpless children who are in these hotel rooms. And uh, it turned out that a group of Catholic sisters were preparing a convention and they asked the event planner only sign on to hotels who have signed on to the code. And so money talks. And uh, it turns out the event planner found photographs of children in these uh, uh, hotel rooms and, sh and sent the photographs to the hotels showing that they were their signature bedding, their signature curtains, and these children were being abused and were being taken advantage of. And yes, the hotel managers did sign on, the corporations did sign on and the convention of 3000 sisters did take place in a hotel that was educating its workers to help these helpless children. So money does talk. We have to be careful who we, who we uh, give our money to. And we have to, as a group, make sure that all corporations are fighting against trafficking side by side with us. And so now we move to Zanta. I was introduced to Zanta Club of Greater Queens at the Center for the Women of New York. They were uh, helping to fund our programs. Uh, Zanta Club of Greater Queens is part of the mission of Zanta International to advance the status of women, girls, and their families through service and advocacy locally and globally. Their motto is think globally, but act locally. So they service um, funds are raised through annual events and then donated to local organizations. And this particular um, club donated to child abuse prevention services and Mount Sinai sexual assault and violence intervention program and the Center for the Women of New York, as well as um, partnering with UNICEF, UN Women and Care International. So now there is a website, uh, Zanta International uh, Caucus USA, USA Caucus. Um, so it's zantausa.org. And this is where this information is from. And Zanta International has eight goals to empower women and girls. Zanta USA Caucus has chosen five of those. Human trafficking is one of those goals. They want to eradicate it in the USA. The United Nations defines human trafficking as the recruitment and or transportation of persons through force, fraud, or coercion, as we've heard before. 
and we've heard about the many forms of trafficking. But since Santa has an international spill, spin, we need to address forced marriage and uh, forced uh, um, uh, child soldiering, which we haven't heard too much from our other presenters. Girls alone make up 23% of documented trafficked persons. There have been cases of human trafficking in all 50 states, including Washington, DC. So it affects rural, urban, and suburban areas across the US. And what I want to pay particular attention to is this uh, partner organization of Zantas, Truckers Against Trafficking. Let's go back, supply and demand and transportation of goods. It's all about money. It's all about going after easy money and we need to transport our victims. So why not get the truckers involved? So I do recommend visiting Truckers Against Trafficking website. There's a powerful video there where they uh, document how these two young ladies were kidnapped and uh, transported by truck and they were saved by a truck driver at a truck stop who knew something was wrong and knew about the 800 number for human trafficking. And I did learn from a Zanta sister that on her Zanta business card on the back, she has the human trafficking hotline and the domestic, uh, um, the domestic hotline. So we can all help in very small ways. So now we're ready for your questions. Uh, if you have a moment, please type them into your chat box. Uh, we do have one question ready. Someone would like to know again about, uh, this is for Kyra, about bringing your program into the schools. How do we go about it? And uh, we as a panel had discussed on Friday, the difficulty of going into the schools. We all have programs, we're all ready to present to our children, but we sometimes have difficulty. And I, as a former teacher, expressed the concern that it's all about the test prep and the need to sit, conserve time to teach children how to do well on these tests. So we do have to take advantage of moments in newspapers and um, local um, uh, hot issues. And if they affect the schools, then ride that wave. If you've read something in the newspaper that affected a child in a school, then ride that wave, contact all the schools. And that's when they're ready to make time for such crucial issues. They want their guidance counselors trained. They want their teachers trained. They just don't always have the time. So do get in touch with your schools. So Kyra, tell us how you do it. Um, yeah, so I can also, since I didn't put it at the end of the slideshow, um, I will drop in the chat my emails. So often we'll have schools, we have a list of all the schools in New York City in the five boroughs, and we contact schools um, and we try to contact first underserved or underprivileged schools. Um, but of course we are welcome in all schools. Um, and I think something to keep in mind when, uh, yeah, sort of like Victoria was saying, that we need to raise awareness in order to get this on people's radar. Kara's waiting till the end of the uh, alarm. Oh. Thank you, Kyra. Just shout over it, Kyra. We're ready for you. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was saying that um, sort of how ECTAT, ECTAT approach mimics a lot of the approach for prevention programming in different schools. Um, for example, bullying prevention was not part of a lot of different curricula before it became, we had these high profile cases happening about um, bullying prevention uh, or about different bully, uh, bullying instances where young people may have committed suicide or have faced some sort of psychological harm in relation to bullying. And so now it's very 
pervasive across the country. And so we have to sort of put this on the radar of all stakeholders in this in order to make it important because it is, um, again, all of us have sort of great curricula and great resources. It's really about making sure that people um, understand the importance of it. And so we do our workshops for the most part when we go to schools, we do them either in advisory periods or health class periods or some sort of homeroom period. So we don't necessarily interject too much time from the school, but also um, they get the sort of the critical information that they need. So again, it's about the high profile cases. Jessica and I had something in common. We knew very closely about a high profile case where two children from Korea, uh, one guidance counselor set off the bell that they were being trafficked. They were here uh, with so-called guardians and they were treated as slaves in that household. And um, the younger sibling somehow opened up to a guidance counselor. The guidance counselor quickly uh, notified the other school involved. The older sibling was in a high school and it just set off a chain of events. And Jessica, you can speak to what the DA's office did. Yes, no, that was a, that was a remarkable um, response by the school. I've never seen any school work collaboratively together. And um, they, if it wasn't for the assistant principal, uh, she actually rescued the children. The assistant principal went to the house and demanded their passports from the trafficker before they even got to the police station. And she's the one who recovered their identifications. And the next day on a Saturday, I happen to be working here. The assistant principal brought the children to our intake bureau to have misdemeanor charges written up. Um, and I was here working on another trial and somebody in intake called and said, these children are being forced to work. And they had come, and what was really shocking about that case is they had come through the system and get before this as assault victims at the hand of the mother, um, the you know proposed you know the purported mother, um, and they were not recognized as victim as victims of trafficking at that point. It was they were written up as misdemeanor assault cases and just went through the system. Um, and this time it would happen to be identified. But that's just an also um, important thing we should all be looking at in our work as service care providers and law enforcement um, and dealing with children that often victims of trafficking are coming into contact with our system and are going unrecognized. So that's why the warning signs are very important. Um, we ended up um, reuniting, you know, they, those children were reunited with their family in Korea. Actually, the older daughter, I met with her in February. She was on a college trip to New York over her break um, and the children are doing very well. They're re reunited with their family. They're both in school. Both um, the couple was indicted um, and the trafficker was sentenced to two to six years in prison and then deported um, back to Korea because um, the family really wanted to return to their native country. They stayed here for six months during the pendency of the case. Um, but that was a great example of teamwork and Victoria, you were very astute to mention that that's the time when as advocates, we should be striking while the iron is hot. That's right. um, and once things get media attention, like the bullying campaign uh, is when we should be like, you know, pushing our way into the school because it, it, I mean, I have a teenage daughter, I have to sign papers for them to talk about any little thing in health class. So I think the schools are resistant to talk about, especially sex trafficking in, especially at the middle school level. Cause by the time they get to high school, high school kids are important to educate because they are in contact with a lot of younger children as well and in their communities. But it's really the middle school age, the 12, the 13 year olds, the 14 year olds when they're at risk. Um, our last trial we did involved a 16 year old um, in, the foster care, uh, in the foster care system who met her trafficker on, online, who he claimed to be a tattoo artist and he wanted her to be a tattoo model. And he actually went to her school and picked her up. It turns out he was a 38 year old trafficker um, and he had her for over a month before she was able to escape um, from that situation. But a lot of it's coming out of the schools and I really admire Kyra's work and Epcot's work in, in getting into the schools and advocating for that. Yes. So I don't believe there are any other questions. So if there's 
anything any of the presenters would like to add that you perhaps omitted in your presentation, now would be a good time. Victoria, this is Jackie Haruni, yes. and there's a question as to whether there's any online classes available now. Sorry, I have uh, <clears throat> my voice is not the best today. Um, please look in the chat. Someone's asking for quarantine online classes, um, if there's anything available. Uh, I'm not understanding. Uh, quarantine classes. <clears throat> are there any other are there any other webinars or anything else available? Oh yes. Um, what I did to prepare for this webinar as I was organizing it, I visited quite a few uh, trafficking webinars. Some of them are from overseas, some of them are from other states, and I learned so much. And um, they're there. They're on Eventbrite, they're on Zoom, they're there. You have to search for them. So do an internet search, um, and we very much appreciate this question. Your learning hasn't ended today. There is plenty to learn, and also visit each of the presenters' uh, websites. There are resources there as well, and they will also post uh, future webinars besides doing an internet search and an Eventbrite search. Thank you for that question. And as Sorry, I said, I, I keep learning. I keep learning. So I learned something from each of those webinars. I was Any to, other? Go ahead, Tori. Sorry to that question about online. I know, yeah, we adjusted to COVID because a lot of groups, just like in this setting, couldn't uh, do it in person, obviously. So we do offer that. It's on our website. Um, and I wanted to touch on the question before about getting into schools. Uh, I've also seen in my education work uh, just difficulty and concern from parents about uh, the subject matter. Will it be um, too much for the kids? So something, so there's two approaches I try to take to that. One is like ensuring that um, the presentation material won't be too graphic. It's important information. We don't use uh, pictures that uh, are disempowering to victims. Um, but it is important for the youth to have that information. And also just something that Victoria touched on before, there's other components of human trafficking, such as uh, children in armed conflict, there's forced child marriage, there's maybe other topics uh, that younger groups such as middle school age can start with and then go on to sex trafficking. So um, those topics are just as important because it's very similar exploitation. Uh, and yeah, with a similar sentiment to Tori when talking with middle schoolers about it, um, oft, especially for parents that maybe want to talk at home, there are ways to sort of approach and make sure that they can protect themselves from trafficking. Um, if you don't necessarily want to talk about trafficking yet, such as who are your trusted adults? What does it mean to empathize with someone? Um, you know, yeah, who, who, what is safe touch and what is not safe touch? So there are different, definitely different ways to talk about these things with younger kids as well. As uncomfortable as these topics are, there are plenty of materials out there to soften the language, to use simpler words that are understandable by the youth and to engage them. How do you engage them in answering questions? And it's, it's, there are resources out there. So schools themselves could have this access and have their own guidance counselors give their own trainings. So now I'd like to say a few words about our upcoming events at Center for the Women of New York. We have a book club forming and computer classes are forming uh, to, of course, make women um, uh, financially independent. We have our uh, legal clinic, which is going to uh, pick up. It had um, a little bit of a hiatus for a few months. And uh, we are planning a women artist exhibit and a woman performing artist event. And we're looking forward to our walking group at our new location at Fort Totten Park. And we do offer a caregiver's phone support group and I look forward to it every week. We have a licensed master social worker on the call. And as you know, many caregivers are women who sacrifice so much and yet they don't always have time or know where to get support. So our phone support group is um, very accessible. They can still be with their uh, person that they're caring for and pick up the phone. We also offer conversational 
English as a Second Language classes to empower our immigrant women and again toward financial uh, stability. We also offer referral services to many of your organizations, especially to the court system, Family Justice, Safe Horizon, Queens DA, and uh, we offer these webinars. So please, if you'd like us to continue providing educational programs, please consider donating at cwny.org or joining us as, as members or as volunteers. We have plenty of work for our volunteers. So I want to thank Jessica Melton, Tori Corbello, Amanda Eckert, Kyra Wooden for representing your wonderful organizations and for sharing your expertise. We learned much and we look forward to collaborating with you again. Signing off.